Starting off at number 10 now, we have the corpse train. Now, according to London folklore, in the early 1900s, there was a train that ran underneath the city and it was only for dead people. Back then, London's hospitals and morgues were struggling to deal with the vast amount of people that were dying from poverty and disease. They decided to transport the bodies out of the city, but knew that they couldn't do it overground without disturbing a lot of people. So, they used an existing train line to load the bodies onto. The train ran just the other side of a wall from the normal daily service, where unsuspecting Londoners were getting on and off their trains, unaware of the nearby bodies. Next up at number 8 now, we have Annie. This one comes from Edinburgh, Scotland. In the old town there lies a street known as Mary King's Close. It's steeped in myths and legends of hauntings and murders. In 1990, a psychic called Aiko Gibo visited and felt a small hand touch hers. She said that she then made contact with the spirit of a dead called Annie, who had died in a plague hundreds of years ago and had lost her doll. The psychic then went to a nearby shop and brought back a Barbie doll for her. Now since then, visitors leave dolls for Annie and a mountain of them has built up in the dark. Moving on to number 7 now, we have The Faceless Woman. This one comes from the borough of Barking in London. There you can find Beacon Tree Station, home to The Faceless Woman. The most famous sighting of her happened in 1992. A station supervisor reported that on one night, he heard the handle of his office door rattle. Outside on the platform stood a woman. She had blonde hair, she wore a very pale dress and just stared into the distance. The supervisor approached her, but as he reached out, she turned to him only to reveal she had had no face, just darkness where there should be one. Local ghost hunters claim that she is the victim of a train crash that happened there in 1958 which killed 10 people. At number 6 now we have The Beast. England's Hackney Marshes is known for its sprawling woodland and boggy reed marshes often covered in swirling fog, the perfect setting for this urban legend. The story goes that in 1980, two bear carcasses were found in the river. They had been People started speculating about who or what could cut a bear's head clean off its shoulders. Then a year later, four boys were taking a walk along the marsh one winter morning when they saw it through the trees. They described it as a giant, great, growling, hairy thing. As soon as it saw them, it reared up on its back legs and let out a deafening roar. The boys ran, but the story remains always in the back of people's minds as they trudge through the marsh. We're returning now to the London Underground for our number 5 with The Crying Girl. On November 18th, 1987, a match was dropped on an escalator at London's King Cross Station. A fire quickly spread into the nearby ticket office, which resulted in the death of 31 people. In the years since then, passengers have reported seeing a girl who died around the station. She has long brown hair, wears jeans and a t-shirt, and is always crying. Some people have even reported hearing her sobs while smelling smoke coming out from the escalators. Moving on to number 3 now, we have Cane Hill. Some say this is one of the most haunted places in England. It was a mental asylum for over a hundred years from 1882 to 1991. It built up a reputation for abandoning some of its patients, hiding them away from the public eye and never truly helping them. Some people say the patients who died left their energy behind there because of their tortured lives. The building was gutted by a mysterious fire in 2010. Perhaps the scariest stories of all are of the faces appearing by the burnt out windows. Next up at number 2 now, we have the House of the Screaming Skull. This one comes from Bettiscombe Manor in Dorset, England. The legend goes that in 1830, a man lived there called John Frederick Pinney. He had a slave that he had brought back from the Caribbean island of Nevis. The man became ill and on his deathbed, he swore he would never rest unless his body was returned home to Nevis. Pinney refused to pay for that expense and when he died, he had the man buried in the local graveyard. After that, ill fortune began to plague the village for months. Screams and cries were heard from the cemetery. At the manor house, windows rattled and doors kept slamming. The body was dug up and brought to the manor house where today only the skull remains where it's said to haunt the manor, but the village remains safe. And finally at number 1 now, we have the Hellhounds. Dartmoor is a vast, rocky, windy and mysterious part of England. It's popular among tourists, but everyone who goes there is aware of the legend of the Hellhounds. It's said that a pack of these ghost dogs wanders the moors at night, preying on sheep and they're not afraid of humans. They've often been described as cat-like but with the frame of a bear and very fast. There have been pictures and film taken of them over the years that claim to show glimpses of these hellhounds in action. Many of the locals don't even need that though. They've heard the stories handed down from generation to generation. Some of them even say they've seen the hounds with their own two eyes. Starting off at number 10 now, we have the Tulip Staircase Ghost. In 1966, Reverend R. W. Hardy was visiting the Queen's 
house in Greenwich. There was an old staircase there known as the Tulip Staircase. He decided to take a picture of it. It wasn't until he got his photo developed that he saw this, a figure scaling the stairs that had not been there when he took the picture. The strange hooded figure became known as the Tulip Staircase Ghost. Ghost hunters have now been visiting the site for over 50 years. Many of them have reported strange results from their recording equipment. Looking at that picture, even the most skeptical of people have admitted that the hands and the body do look like an actual person, albeit one that's perhaps locked between the two worlds of the afterlife and the Tulip Staircase. Coming at number 9 now, we have spring heeled Jack. In October 1837, a girl called Mary Stevens was said to have been walking through Clapham Common in England when a strange figure leapt at her from a dark alleyway. He began to kiss her face while ripping her clothes off with his claws before fleeing the scene. The next day, the same figure caused a carriage to crash. This time, they said that he breathed fire, laughed, and then jumped over a nine foot high wall. Locals began to call him Spring Heeled Jack. The following year, a woman called Jane Aslop said that she answered the door to a man claiming to be a police officer who said they caught Spring Heeled Jack. She brought him a candle, at which point he tore his cloak off, vomited blue and white flames from his mouth, while his eyes resembled red balls of fire. He tore at her with his long claws, but she managed to escape. It's been over 180 years since then, but that hasn't stopped the legend of Spring Hill Jack from living on. Next up, number eight now, we have the Highgate Vampire. In 1969, a man called David Farrant reported seeing a ghostly grey figure walking through the Highgate Cemetery. As more reports poured in, another man called Sean Manchester stepped forward to say he knew what the sightings were of, a vampire. Eventually, people began to believe this. Local people went hunting around the cemetery looking for the vampire, armed with crucifixes and heavy wooden stakes. Sean claimed a sleepwalking girl had actually led him to the graves one night to kill the monster. He and David became convinced that a group of Satanists were using the cemetery to summon demons and that the vampire was just one of many. Although the media frenzy has died down now over the years, many locals still swear there's something not right about that cemetery and so the legend of the vampire lives on. Coming at number 7 now, we have the Screams of the Dead. In 1943, Bethnal Green in East London experienced one of the worst tragedies of World War II. It wasn't from bombs, but panic. During air raid siren tests, civilians on their way to shelter in the tube station began to converge on the same entrance all at once. In their panic to get down, some people tripped and then a stampede began. People fell to the ground and were crushed. 173 people were trampled to death, including at least 41 children. Locals say the place never really healed. They report hearing women screaming and children crying in the station and a deep sense of dread in the night air. Moving on to number 6 now, we have a weird one. It's called the Frittening. This was the name given to a creature that's said to live on the Isle of Shetland in Scotland. Locals claim that it's a boneless, blob-like beast that will scare anyone who sees it to death. Those that caught a glimpse and lived to tell the tale described it as looking like a bag of wet sand or wool. Others said it was an armless, legless, ghastly, wet, vile thing that pressed its lidless eye against their windows. I'm a little bit worried because that description kind of fits me if I'm having a rough morning. Next up at number 5 now we have Netta Fornario. This woman from London was said to be a member of the occult. In the summer of 1929, at the age of 30, she left London for Iona, a small Scottish island steeped in folklore. She joined a secretive occult group known for their ritual magic, tarot cards, mysticism, telepathy and a deep interest in fairies. After some months, her landlady found her one morning in a frenzy, packing her luggage. She told the landlady that she needed to return to London immediately as several members of the cult were attacking her telepathically. The landlady said she would have to wait as the boat didn't run on Sundays. Netta became enraged and retreated to her room. She eventually calmed down and said she would stay and that she was going out for a walk. When she didn't return by nightfall, the landlady raised the alarm. After two days, a search party found her body. She was found lying on top of some turf that had a cross carved into it. She was wearing only a thin black cloak. The doctor who examined her body could not find any cause of death. Her body was in a fine physical condition, it was just 
dead. Officials put it down to exposure to the elements on the cold Scottish island. Others believe she was killed by a psychic telepathic attack generated by someone miles away. Moving on to number 4 now we have the Boggart. If you are a Harry Potter fan you may have heard of the Boggart before but did you know it's based on a real legend. Boggart Hole Clough is a 190 acre area of ancient woodland that is said to be haunted by a Boggart, a mischievous spirit that typically lives in fields and marshes but can also be found indoors. They are usually known for their harmless peskiness, turning milk sour or making objects disappear but some people say they have a much darker side. They are often blamed for the abduction of children. The one that gives its name to Boggart Hole Clough is claimed to be notorious for this. It's been said that it was so active once that a farmer and his family were driven from their home for fear of the Boggart stealing their children. Next up number 3 now we have the figure in the studio. In an interview with a Londonist, a couple of radio hosts from Resonance FM in London told a story that has sparked a modern day urban legend, the figure in the studio. They said that one day while working in the radio station they saw an evil spirit more malevolent than anything you can imagine. It was just standing there at night in their offices watching them. It looked like a shadow with angry red rimmed eyes and strange looking dark teeth. Just before they called out to it the spirit smiled revealing its long teeth and then it disappeared. Many local ghost hunters are convinced that they have discovered a new spirit and that this won't be the last haunting of the figure in the studio. Moving on to number 2 now we have the Devil's Bridge. According to legend the devil visited Karadig in Wales in the 11th century after hearing about its breathtaking scenery. Yes, even the devil appreciates a good view. While there he struck a bargain with a local woman whose cow was stranded across the river. In a bid to buy her soul, the devil said he'd build her a bridge in exchange for the soul of the first living thing that crossed it. He was obviously hoping for hers. When the bridge was built, the woman threw a loaf of bread across which her dog chased. The devil couldn't take the dog's soul. He was said to be so embarrassed and ashamed that he never returned to Wales again. In the village of Devil's Bridge today, there are three crossings across that river. The oldest is said to be the one built by Satan himself. Starting off at number 10 now, we have Who Put Bella in the Witch Elm? Those are the words that first appeared in graffiti in 1944 in Birmingham. They may sound like nonsense to you but they were referencing a murder. You see the year before, four boys in the nearby town of Hagley discovered the body of a woman in the trunk of a witch elm. Police estimated that she had been killed and put there about 18 months before. The woman was never identified but the graffiti, that creepy question of who put Bella in the witch elm, that kept appearing. It seemed that whoever started writing that message had knowledge about the case or may have even been the one who killed the woman, presumed to be called Bella. In the decades since then there have been a number of theories about who killed Bella. Some say she was a victim of witchcraft and that her severed hand was proof of a dark ritual called the hand of glory. Either way it seems that someone was once out there who knew what really happened and wanted to get people to investigate by writing that one creepy question everywhere they could. Alright moving on to number 9 now we have the Solway Spaceman. This one used to creep me out a lot as a kid. I was absolutely fascinated by it though. Perhaps some of you guys watching this are about the same age as I was when I discovered this so I'm happy to pass this on to the next generation. The Solway Spaceman is a mysterious picture taken in 1964 by Jim Templeton in Cumbria, England. Jim took the picture of his 5 year old daughter but to his surprise when he got the picture developed there appeared to be a figure in a space suit in the background. Jim insisted that he did not see anyone around them when the picture was taken. It didn't take long for people to start talking about aliens or time travellers. These theories only grew louder when Jim claims two men who said they were from the government visited him but refused to show any ID and then demanded he showed them where the picture was taken. In the years since then some have said that the spaceman is nothing more than a view of Jim's wife from behind, her dress appearing white from overexposure. Read a full article on this if you like. It's a really really interesting story. Moving on now to number 6 we have Britain's Roswell. That's the nickname that's been given to a bizarre incident that took place in 1980 in Suffolk. Locals in Rendlesham Forest reported strange lights in the area. At first people dismissed it but then even a US military official who was stationed there reported seeing flying lights in the sky that lowered into the woods and sent cattle into a state of frenzy. When they got to the spot where the lights appeared to land they found only burnt marks on the ground. One of the American officials who witnessed the event was Colonel Charles Holt. He reported the sightings to the British Ministry of Defence. When they didn't 
appear to make any efforts to investigate, he accused both the US and the UK of having agents cover up the whole event. To this day, no official explanation has been given for Britain's Roswell. Coming at number 5 now, we have the hairy hands of Devon. This one comes from the 1920s in Devon, a time when locals swore there were a roaming pair of hairy hands in the area. This is perhaps the strangest one on this list. Back then, there was a strange surge of fatal and serious crashes on a stretch of road that travels through a desolate patch of Dartmoor. Some of the crashes were fatal, but from the survivors came a strange tale. Many of them said a pair of rough, hairy hands appeared out of nowhere, grabbed their steering wheel, and smashed their cars into a ditch. Police investigated the road, and they found that there was a problem with its surface. Others weren't convinced though, and said they'd never had any problems with the road, either before or after the hairy hands incidents. So what exactly was it? Moving on to number 4 now, we have the Loch Ness Monster. This has to make the cut in a video like this. Whether or not you believe an ancient reptilian creature lurks the waters of Loch Ness in Scotland, there is still a lot of mystery surrounding its many sightings. Going back over 1,400 years ago, Saint Columba was said to have rescued a man from suffering a brutal attack from a water beast in the River Ness. This story seemed to bubble under the surface with the local community for hundreds of years, but in 1933, after a number of sightings, people began to refer to the beast as the Loch Ness Monster. In 1934, Robert Kenneth Wilson published a photograph of what people claimed to be proof of Nessie. The picture showed a creature with dinosaur-like features with a long neck and a small head. The picture was later found to be a hoax, but the legend itself has never died down, becoming an international phenomenon. Like I said at the start, even if you don't think the Loch Ness Monster is real, all these sightings over the years require some sort of explanation. Moving on now to number 3. Three, we have Jill Dando. In 1999, Jill Dando was a prime time TV journalist famous across the country. She was after arriving home in Fulham, West London at 11.30am on April 26th, 1999. She had just put her key in the lock when someone grabbed her from behind. The killer held her with his right arm, forced her to the ground and fired a single shot through her left temple in what police described as a professional style execution. The following year, police arrested a Barry George who lived nearby to Jill's house. He was convicted and jailed for life, but eventually won an appeal against conviction in 2007. Since then, police have been exploring a number of different leads, including a jealous ex-boyfriend, Eastern European assassins, a mistaken identity, or perhaps the fact that she worked on Crime Watch, a show that exposed criminals to a national audience. Either Way, it's been 19 years and counting, but there are still shadows of doubt over the case. Moving on to number 2 now, we have the Highgate Vampire. This one comes from North London, where Highgate Cemetery is said to have been home to an actual vampire during the 1960s. Some of you guys might just dismiss this right away as an urban legend, but a vampire is perhaps the only explanation for this mystery, no matter how far-fetched it seems. Back then, a group of young people who were interested in the occult began roaming the overgrown cemetery. On December on 21st, 1969, one of the group, David Farrant, spent the night there. What happened on that night remained a mystery for two months, but David couldn't hold it back anymore. On December 21st, 1969, he wrote a letter to his local paper saying he had seen a supernatural grey figure. Other people began to speak up and said that they had seen a figure too. A tall man wearing a hat, a ghostly cyclist, and also a figure walking out into a pond. There were too many sightings now to just dismiss. A man called Shaw Manchester put forward the theory that a king vampire of the undead was practicing black magic there. Some of you may dismiss that as ridiculous, but so far it really is the best theory for these mysterious sightings. Coming into number 10, we have the upside down horseshoe. In the UK, horseshoes are a big symbol of good luck. This is for a number of reasons. One being that they're made from iron and forged in fire, which makes them representative of something strong and unbreakable. In folklore, goblins and demons are said to be afraid of iron. Also, horses don't seem to feel pain when horseshoes are hammered to their feet, which leads many people to believe that they're magical. A lot of people hang horseshoes in or outside of their homes in the UK, and it's also customary to give a bride a horseshoe on her wedding day. The two prongs are supposed to collect and store good luck. Great! 
Sure, but woe betide you if you ever invert that horseshoe. Like, ever. Conversely, an upside down horseshoe is terrible luck in Britain. Any luck stored would immediately be poured out and lost. Others say that an upside down horseshoe would actually attract negativity. Sticking with shoes at number 9, we have new shoes on the table. Has anyone seen Blood Brothers the Musical? I'm pretty sure it's the only musical that Danny's ever seen. Anyway, one of the major omens in the musical that foreshadows the death of the twins is new shoes on the table. This is a classic British superstition. Shoes have a lot of superstition and cultural implications across the world, but in the UK, new shoes on the table is a terrible omen that invites bad luck into your life. Some people believe it signifies that you will have a fight with someone that you love, others say that it's a death omen, which is probably linked to the tradition of placing minors old shoes on a table in the event of their death at work. Cheery. Coming into number 8, never open an umbrella indoors. Like never, don't do it, freaks me out even thinking about it. Opening a brolly, as we call it in the UK, is a surefire way to invite bad luck if you do it inside. In fact they say opening an umbrella indoors will mean bad luck will rain on you. Some say it is an insult to the sun god, others say it's an insult to the guardians of your home. Opening an umbrella indoors practically can actually cause you ill fortune because you could break something, but in British superstition it runs much different deeper than that. Coming into number 7, you should never sweep on New Year's Day. So this is a Scottish tradition and one that I observed this year as a precautionary measure. My friend Denise, who's Scottish, shout out Denise if you're watching, actually told me about this and I really did not want any 2019 bad luck. So it is bad luck to start the new year with a dirty house, so you should always clean your house and take your bins out and tidy before new year, but when the clock strikes 12, you should not do any sweeping, vacuuming or mopping until the 2nd of January. Now the reason for this is because you will sweep away all of the good luck for the year which really isn't what you want. Coming into number 6, we have salt over the shoulder. If you spill salt in the UK, it is a terrible omen. In order to protect yourself from bad luck when you spill salt, you have to throw some over your left shoulder. Now the reasoning is because when you spill the salt, the devil is invited to watch over you. Sure. Throwing salt is said to be in order to get him in the eye, so basically throw the salt at the devil, this distracts him from causing you any trouble. If you don't throw any salt when you spill salt, watch out, the devil's here. Coming in at number 5, never pass on the stairs. Stairs can be dangerous if you aren't using them properly. Once I fell down the stairs and actually fractured my leg and a lot of older people end up having falls when climbing up or down the stairs. In the UK, it is absolutely bad luck to trip up on the stairs, but I guess that just makes sense. Crashing on the stairs, however, is the utmost bad luck in the UK. It's bad luck for both parties involved as well, you just don't want to be involved in it. It suggests that you will come across a great conflict in the near future. I didn't realise it was wasn't a thing elsewhere in the world, when I come across other people on the stairs in Canada, I either walk back up or down so we don't have to cross and usually people will look at me like I'm mad, but it's because I don't want you to get bad luck, so really you should be thanking me. Coming into number 4, never leave a white tablecloth out overnight. Never leave a white tablecloth out overnight on a table, as it is a sign that you will need a shroud in the house in the near future. A shroud is a traditional burial garment, so basically the superstition is saying that someone will die soon if you leave it out. Honestly, not ideal. Similarly, 13 people should never dine together, as the first to leave the table will be the first to die in the group. Coming into number 3, we have 3 drains in a row. Never walk over 3 drains in a row. In the UK, people believe this will bring you terrible, terrible, terrible luck. Some have no idea what bad luck is coming, just it simply is bad to do it. Others say that it's a sign that a lot of people will walk over your grave one day. There's also an old British belief that if you shudder, it's because someone's walking over your gravestone. They could be linked. If you do accidentally walk over three drains, you can remedy the bad luck by spitting on the last drain, or finding a solitary drain to walk over. Coming into number 2, you must always salute the magpie. Seeing a magpie on its own is a terrible omen in the UK, we have a rhyme that applies to the spotting of magpies, one for sorrow, two for joy, three for a girl, four for a boy, although the original rhyme is one for sorrow, two for mirth, three for a wedding and four for death, five for silver, six for gold, seven for a secret not to be told. 8 for heaven, 9 for hell, 10 for the devil's own cell. If you see 1 magpie, it is an omen of sorrow, 4 is an omen of death, 9 for hell and of course 10 for the devil. Back years again. In order to rid yourself of the bad luck associated with seeing magpies, you must always salute them. If you see just 1 magpie, you should salute and say, hello Mr Magpie, how's your wife? Good. 
great. We're all crazy. Finally, an urban legend and a superstition and fear all in one, we have the ravens of the Tower of London. Ravens in a lot of culture are bad omens, but for the UK, specifically the crown, they are absolutely necessary. We need them, if not bad luck will ensue. Ever since the Tower of London has stood, which in some form has been for the best part of a thousand years, there have been ravens there. We don't know why the ravens came, where they came from and why they want to stay, but the superstition and legend is that the tower must have at least six ravens, if not the British monarchy will fall. The legend is enduring and was delivered to King Charles II on a need to know basis. He was considering having all the ravens killed, but it was only then that he was told that he shouldn't do it. It must have been passed down through word of mouth for generations. Since the 1600s, we have been keeping ravens there forcibly. Today, there's an actual raven master, a beef eater whose job it is to tend to the captive ravens at the tower. Currently, we have six and a spare. Their names right now are Hardy, Thor, Odin, Gwenelum, Cedric, Eugene, and Munin. They all sound like lads. Good on you, ravens. At one point in history, the ravens did almost leave the tower. During World War II, they couldn't abide by the sounds coming from the bombing of London. Luckily, though, one remained, and the UK did not fall, nor did the monarchy. Starting us off with number 10 is the Beast of Bodmin Moor. Located in Cornwall, the Beast of Bodmin Moor is said to be a black panther looking cat that's meant to be three to five feet long with glowing yellow eyes. A total of 60 sightings of the beast have been reported, as well as people having found a bunch of mutilated slain livestock with no explanation for their deaths. The evidence was so abundant that the government actually launched an investigation looking into the beast but found no further evidence for the cat but also no evidence against it either. So many assumed it was an escaped cat from someone's private collection and it wasn't reported to authorities because it's obviously illegal. But things really got wild when less than a week later, after the investigation, a boy was walking along River Foy when he found a huge cat skull. The lower jaw was missing, but it had two massive canines, implying it could have been a leopard. So what kind of three to five foot cat is lethal enough to kill a leopard? After a lot of investigation, they found the skull was actually from a leopard, but it had been imported as part of a leopard skin rug. It had cuts on it showing the flesh had been scraped off with a knife, not another cat's teeth. So that was a dead end, but it still excited people enough to reignite the myth. I mean, not that it really died to begin with, but it was reignited. Coming in at number 9 are Boggarts. Not the ones from Harry Potter, what a time and a half that would be. No, these ones are either household spirits or they live in fields and marshes. The ones found in houses are known to just cause a lot of chaos. They steal things, they make dogs go lame, they can turn milk sour, sometimes they crawl into your bed and put their hands all over you and despite sounding annoying as hell, they are very loyal to the family they're with. A household boggart follows its family everywhere they go, so at least it'll annoy you for life. You know, like a sibling. Boggarts found outside are a lot more dangerous. They're known to abduct children, kill animals, and all around cause harm. To protect yourself and keep them away, you can hang a horseshoe outside your door or leave a pile of salt outside your bedroom, but the biggest warning is that you should never name a boggart. Once you name it, that's pretty much it. You're done. It can't be reasoned with, you can't persuade it, it just becomes uncontrollably destructive. Looks wise, they look like mini humans with bestial feet. Features. Their arms are extremely long, and despite being small, they're still as strong as a full grown horse, so don't mess with them. At number eight are the Chime Hours. So, this one got me excited, so you guys better get excited too. Now, this myth originated in Northern England, and it's referring to the time of someone's birth. It's believed that people born during particular hours of the day and night have special abilities and are referred to as a Chime Child or Chime Children. Based on what source you're reading from, the abilities you gain when being a child chime child really varies and the hours that are considered chime hours also vary. According to Charles Dickens, a very, you know, reputable source, it's 12 a.m. exactly. Others claim it's at the hours of monastic prayer, so that's 8 p.m., midnight, and 4 a.m. Either way, regardless of the hours, the abilities are pretty X-Men-esque. Some people become super perceptive with animals and become able to communicate with them. Some become able to see and speak to ghosts and fairies. Some gain healing abilities, but most of all, being around chime children causes you to lower your guard and speak super openly, so these people basically 
likely know a hell of a lot about a lot of people. Chime children definitely they ain't, they ain't playing around. But there is a catch. It's said that if these people use their powers selfishly instead of to benefit others, they will just perish. I'd honestly love to be a chime child. I need to WhatsApp my mum now and ask her what time I was born. Probably not any of those times, but Here's to hoping. Filling our number seven slot, we have the Rat Man of South End, and it's a pretty straightforward myth, honestly. Now, this one is more of an urban legend than a myth, but I feel like in some cases both of those things are synonymous, so just. The myth of Ratman goes like this. Years ago, an old homeless man was seeking shelter in the winter and decided to sit in an underpass. A group of teenagers came from nowhere and started beating up the man, nearly killing him. It's said that as he was dying, a bunch of vermin living in the underpass started eating his face. After he finally passed away, many people have reported seeing a ghost in that underpass, whereas others have heard very loud rat like squealing and large claws moving across the walls. Too big for a normal rat but the right size for a rat man. Now at number 6 is Waylon Smithy. Now Waylon Smithy is a neolithic chamber tomb and long barrow in Oxfordshire. Archaeologists say it was built soon after agriculture was introduced to Britain from Europe. But post 1738 it was believed that the site held more than what met the eye. Francis Wise, whoever the hell that is, said that a long time ago an invisible smith used to live at Waylon Smith as he called it. If a traveller's horse ever lost a shoe on the road, all they had to do was bring the horse and a small bit of money to Waylon Smith and leave both there for a while. Upon their return, the money would be gone and the horse's shoe would be back on. Ever since the myth started circulating, there have been countless coins left at the site with people literally shoving them in there in any crack they can. These days, people from the National Trust remove the coins from the site and donate them to local charities, but the myth lives on. Coming in at Number five is Drake's drum. Now this is more of a historical myth surrounding Sir Francis Drake. And if you don't know who he is, he was basically an explorer, sea captain, and slave trader during the Elizabethan era. I feel like most people have heard of his name, but a lot of people don't actually know what his story is. So there you go. Now it was said that he used to take a drum with him on his voyages around the world. The drum was pretty bougie. It had his coat of arms on it, some silver stud. It was decorative. Either way, the drum was with him on his last voyage, and as he was laying on his deathbed, his last wish was that the drum be returned to England and in times of trouble, it should be hit in order to call him back from heaven and rescue the country. Heavy words, Rudy. The drum was then given back to his family, but it's become a huge icon in English folklore. Many say they've heard the drum beating during times of conflict, like when World War I began, or when Napoleon was brought to England as a prisoner, to name a few. Despite it being hit a bunch of times, a resurrected Sir Francis Drake is just nowhere to be found. At number four is Renadine. This was originally in an old ballad called The Mountains High, which basically said Renadine was a were fox that could attract all beautiful women to him, and when they did come, to him, he would kidnap them and take them away to his castle. One day, he encounters a girl in the wilderness and abducts her. And what happens after that point is kind of left open ended, but I'm sure you can imagine all what kinds of horrors would be taking place. Probably just some Netflix and chill. Either way, the myth first started going around as a warning to young girls to not trust charming strangers, which is fair enough, we still shouldn't do that even now, just making it clear. And either way, as time went on, the myth became a lot more magical and a lot less rational. So this one is most likely untrue, but it's still a good story to tell when you know you just want to get some morals across to children. Filling our number three slot are brownies. Not the chocolate kind, but I'm really hungry right now, so I totally wish it was. Damn my bad lunch planning. But either way, like boggets, brownies are also household spirits, but they're surprisingly a lot nicer. They usually come out at night and actually perform chores around the house and farming tasks. What more could you ask for, honestly? To keep them happy, all you literally have to do is leave out a bowl of cream or milk for them by the hearth of your house and they'll be happy chappies, really. That's like the best trade deal in the history of trade deals, like to wake up, have your house cleaned all for a bowl of milk. I'm not even mad. I'm not I'm really not even mad at that. I wouldn't even ask the brownie to pay rent. Just sleep in my bed if you want. Just please clean my house. But it's not all rainbows and butterflies. If a brownie thinks you've offended it or taken advantage of it in any way, it'll leave your house forever and pull pranks on you before it does. Again, if you anger them, they'll turn 
violent and malicious like boggarts. Are they distant cousins or something? Looks wise they're described as ugly which is just rude, covered in hair and brown skinned. In olden times they were said to be human sized but nowadays the myth is that they're a lot smaller, more like an elf. They can even turn invisible and are usually wearing rags or are naked which sounds very dobby like. Now at number 2 is the Highgate Vampire. This myth was huge in the 70s I'm talking proper media frenzy. So in the late 60s a group of occult enthusiasts visited the Highgate Cemetery in London. According to them they were arranged flowers taken from graves and put in circular patterns all pointing to a new grave that was uncovered. The coffin was open and the body inside had a huge iron stake in the form of a cross driven straight through the lid and into the corpse's chest. David Farrant, a journalist, claimed he had seen a grey figure in the cemetery one night and 13 other people responded to him saying they had seen something similar. Now the accounts kept saying different things, one said it was a tall man in a hat, a figure going into a pond, others said it was a woman in white and then Sean Manchester whoever that is claimed it was a vampire. So the media went between Sean's story and David's both competing to see who'd get to the bottom of the story first. Sean even hosted an exorcism in the cemetery and a bunch of hunters showed up swarming the gates. A few months later a headless charred remains of a woman were found close to where the open grave was. Most believed it was the vampire doing black magic but no one knows for sure. Regardless of which side of the myth you believe, for the past 25 years numerous numerous people have claimed seeing a vampire in the cemetery. Are you one of those people? Let me know below. And finally at number 1 we have Longleat House. The 1000 acre home is home to one of the longest mazes in the world, one of the best safari parks in Europe and gardens for days, but it has a dark past. Back in 1733 the estate was owned by Viscount Weymouth and he soon married Lady Louisa who moved into the house with him bringing with her a bunch of servants. She was quite fond of one of the servants in particular, a footman. Her fondness created jealousy among the other servants which caused them to tell the Viscount that he was having an affair with Lady Louisa. And it's said that wasn't true but I mean I have my doubts. In a fit of rage he wanted revenge and the next events are a bit contested. It was said he either hired someone to ambush the footman and throw him down the staircase or he did it himself. Either way the footman got royally screwed because he ended up dying from a broken neck and was buried in the home cellar. The next day the Viscount told Lady Louisa that the footman had left in the early morning but she got the feeling something just wasn't quite right. She spent all her waking hours searching the house for him which took a major toll on her body causing her to die from pneumonia mid birth. She died never knowing the true story behind the footman and so people claim they still see the ghost of her on the estate looking for him. Now many have reported seeing a lady in grey in the corridors of the house and near the stairway where he died. Despite this sounding completely made up they actually found a body in the cellar of the house and it was a male dressed in period footman uniform. So the story checks out and so does the ghost. Why couldn't the Viscount just have asked his wife about the situation like why did the footman have to die? No one had to die in the situation. Alright next up at number 9 now guys we have the devils in the bins. The house of the bins is an old Scottish ancestral home. General Tam Daliel was the head of the Daliel family in the 17th century. Now while he lived there Tam claimed that every night the devil visited him in his home for a game of cards. He said the devil usually won. Now in retrospect this might have been a good thing. You see one night the devil appeared as usual and as usual the devil and Tam sat down to play cards. This night was different though. This night for the first time ever Tam seemed to be getting the upper hand. He was winning. As the game went on the devil got more and more angry about this. Eventually when the game looked lost for him he flew into a rage. The devil then threw a single marble at Tam. It missed and instead landed in the sergeant's pond outside the house. Now for many years people laughed at Tam and dismissed his story as insane. Then over 200 years later the pond outside was apparently drained and what what should they find buried in the mud at the bottom but a single shiny marble? He lost his marble! Zuh. One marble. One marble? At number 8 we've got Abandoned Annie. The city chambers is a famous building in Edinburgh with ancient alleys that run beneath. The streets below the city chambers are said to be haunted and they attract psychics, ghost hunters and mediums. This is because back in the 16th and 17th centuries this particular area of Edinburgh was hit extremely hard by the plague. The streets used to be littered with bodies and sick people who were banished and left for dead. After the 18th century the abandoned homes and alleys were sealed but that doesn't stop people from venturing down there. 
air. There have been many strange noises and sightings reported, but most notably, a psychic claims to have come into contact with the ghost of a young girl named Annie. Abandoned Annie is a story that began in 1992 after a Japanese psychic called Eiko Gibo went to the close as a part of a documentary on paranormal activity. When the group were touring the area, she came across a room that she at first was too afraid to enter. She said the room had a terrible feeling of sickness, hunger, and cold. But then Eiko went inside the room because she said she was invited by the ghost of a little girl named Annie who had died of the plague. Annie grabbed her hand and said that she had been abandoned by her family and that she had lost her doll. Eiko later went back to the room with a Barbie for Annie to play with and since then, visitors to Annie's room are told to bring a gift for her. There is now a pile of toys created by people who have visited her room. To this day, people report feeling sick, uneasy, and cold while visiting Annie's room, despite the fact that there is no historical record of any girl named Annie, and the story has been dismissed as a popular urban myth. An urban myth that actually has a happy purpose, apparently. Along with toys, people leave money for Annie, and at the end of every year, the money is counted and given to the sick kids' hospital. So far, Annie has raised more than 45,000 pounds for other sick children. Next up, number seven now, guys. We have the A75. Now, that is the name of what's said to be the most haunted road in Scotland, bar none. It runs through the county of Dumfriesshire and has been a hub of reports of supernatural activity over the years. It's actually attracted paranormal investigators investigators to it from all over the world. Kathleen Crone is the founder of Mostly Ghostly, great name by the way. Now she said there have been screaming hags, eyeless phantoms and a menagerie of unearthly creatures witnessed on this famous road. In 1962, perhaps one of the most famous sightings occurred on the road. Derek and Norman Ferguson were driving along the road when a large hen apparently flew into the windscreen of their car. They then saw huge cats and other monstrous creatures pass by by them, as well as a phantom furniture van, whatever that is, all of which vanished into thin air. In the years since then, the number of stories has grown to the point where some truck drivers actually avoid the A75 altogether. All right, it is time for number six, the boneless. The true story of the boneless comes from the Shetland Islands, a group of small islands off the coast of Scotland, where the inhabitants were once terrorized by a ghostly blob. Yes, you heard that correctly. Stories about a ghostly apparition called the boneless, and sometimes a frittening, have been whispered on the Shetland Island for years now. It's based on an account found in the book Shetland Traditional Lore by Jesse Saxby. Although no one could describe the apparition properly, people called it the boneless because witnesses say it looked like a giant glowing white blob. Others said it looked like a jellyfish or a slimy white cloud. The boneless would appear pressed up against windows and it never made a sound. It could move though. Apparently it could move faster than a dog. If you had happened to find yourself face to face with the boneless, you would cower in fear and often die of fright. There's a story about one boy who was dragged by the boneless to the edge of the cliff. He described it as smelling like rotting flesh. As he heard the waves crashing below, he grabbed the rocks and hung on for life. The boneless rolled off the cliff and disappeared, and the boy managed to drag himself back to his home to tell his parents. And the boy managed to drag himself back to his home to tell his parents. Next, at number five, we've got the haunting of Castle Stewart. The story goes like this. The Earl of Moray inherited Castle Stewart from his father. He wanted to rent it out, but he couldn't because the castle had such a bad reputation for being haunted. So the Earth tried to improve the castle's reputation by offering a reward to any man who was brave enough to spend the night in the castle. News about the reward spread and eventually four men agreed. A minister, an elder in the Presbyterian church, a local shoemaker, and the last was a large man named Rob Angus. The deal was each of the men had to spend an entire night alone in a haunted room. Once they were inside, the door would be locked and wouldn't be unlocked locked until the next morning. The minister fell asleep in the room and had a dream about a blood splattered man who sat down next to him. When he woke up, no one was there. The elder had a similar experience. While he was reading his bible, the door to the room sprang open and in walked a man covered in blood. The man drew his dagger on the elder who fainted. He was found the next morning in complete shock. When it was the shoemaker's turn, he heard the door to the room open. A tall man with hooves for feet appeared in the doorway. The being jumped at the shoemaker and he fainted in terror. He was found unconscious on the floor the next morning. And lastly, it was Rob Angus's turn. Rob Angus was a big strong Scotsman who said he wasn't afraid of anything. As the servant closed the door to his room, he said, you will find me as I am or dead. When the servant returned in the morning, the furniture in the room was broken and all over the place, but there was no sign of Rob. But then, the servant looked out the window and saw Rob Angus lying on the ground, dead. At some point, Rob Angus fell out of the window or was pushed. Various sightings and reports of paranormal activity over the years have given Castle Stewart the reputation of being one of the most haunted castles in the world. Coming at number 4 now guys, we have Arthur's Seat Coffin. Coming at number 4 now guys, we have the Arthur's Seat Coffins. This one comes from Edinburgh. Arthur's Seat is a rocky hill there. So 
sort of a landmark, if you will. One day in 1836, five local boys discovered an entrance to a small cave on the rugged northeastern face of that famous hill. There, they found some intricately carved miniature figures set in coffins. I know. That's incredibly creepy. The 17 coffins had actually been left undisturbed for an unknown amount of time. Each casket contained expertly carved human effigies creepily dressed in very unique clothing. They had painted black boots on and twisted facial expressions. In the years since then, these creepy coffins have defied all attempts to explain them. This has opened the door to a number of creepy urban legends surrounding them. The most popular is that they were created to commemorate the 17 victims of the notorious Edinburgh murderers and grey Grave robbers, Burke and Hare. I'm no relation to that Burke though. Okay, maybe somewhere along the line. Awkward. Moving on to number two now, we have Gilly Do. I think I'm pronouncing that right. In Scottish legend, he's a solitary Scottish male fairy that lives alone in the forest. He disguises himself in trees so as not to be seen by humans. His light green skin and long branch arms make it almost impossible for people to spot him. However, it's important to note that the Gilly Do is usually only this elusive to adults. You see, he's been known to appear and interact with friendly children. Now, you should know that doesn't mean that every interaction is a good one. He has been known to prey on people lost in the woods, killing or enslaving them. Perhaps the strangest thing I read about this creature is that he is said to collect the teeth of children to perform protective magic on them. This has led some people to believe that the Gilly Do actually gave birth to the legend of the Tooth Fairy. A much lighter story. I think we can all agree. I don't think the Tooth Fairy has killed or enslaved anyone. If you know otherwise, let me know. And finally number one now, we have the Mackenzie Poltergeist. This is perhaps the most famous ghost story in all of Scotland. The Black Mausoleum is the name of a tomb in Edinburgh's Greyfriars Cemetery and has become famous as the home of an evil paranormal entity. Over the years, visitors have reported feeling extreme hot spots and cold spots. They leave with cuts, bruises and burns on their body. Photographic evidence for the legend includes pictures of these injuries as well as pictures from inside the tomb that some claim show an unidentified shape. Others have reported seeing a white figure in the dark, smelling strange odours and hearing knocking noises under the ground and even from inside the tomb itself. If that wasn't enough for you, locals have gone to the grave some days to find dead animals in front of the Black Mausoleum. Some people have even claimed to have been possessed, which led to the grounds being exercised twice, both unsuccessfully, apparently. In the past few decades, it seems as though the Mackenzie poltergeist has begun to spread. Poltergeist activity has been reported in four different houses around the graveyard and in 2002 a large fire broke out in the residences behind George Mackenzie's tomb. Starting off at number 10 now we have the big grey man of Ben Macdui. Amphir Liath Moor is the Gaelic name of a mythical creature known as the big grey man who is said to dwell at the summit of Scotland's Ben Macdui mountain. Over the years many climbers have felt his presence or even seen him, a lumbering giant that skulks in the thick fog of the mountain peak. He's often described as being very large, sometimes about 10 feet tall when standing completely upright. Short hairs cover his whole body, especially thick on his broad shoulders. His arms are also said to swing wildly when he's sighted. Sightings of this creature have gone back for centuries, but the first credible account came from Professor Norman Colley in 1891. The day he saw it, he made a note in his journal saying, I was returning home from a calm on the summit in the mist when I began to think I heard something else other than my own footsteps. Steps. For every few steps I took, I had a crunch and then another crunch as if someone was walking after me but taking footsteps three or four times the length of my own. His account ends up going into much more detail but for many people, this account and a few others are more than enough to convince them of the big grey man of Ben Macdui. Moving on to number 9 now, we have Cathedral House Hotel. This building in Glasgow was originally built in 1877 as a halfway house for prisoners who had been released from the nearby Duke Street prison. That prison was the site of many executions over the years, including 12 in the 20th century. The last person to be executed in Scotland, Susan Newell, was hanged at the prison in October 1923 after being found guilty of strangling a paperboy. In the years since the last execution, locals swear that the spirits of the executed have made their home in the nearby Cathedral House Hotel. Some say they have felt a ghostly presence brush up against them on the staircase. There have also been several reports of two ghostly children being heard on the top floor of the 
the hotel and items of furniture moving of their own accord. In 2005, the Ghost Finders Scotland group conducted a thorough investigation using high tech equipment. They recorded unusual EMF and tri field readings along with light orbs and various other anomalies appearing on both video footage and still photographs. Moving on to number 8 now, we have the Well of the Dead. Nice name. Many Scots will be familiar with the Jacobite Rising of 1746. On April 16th of that year, the Scottish forces fighting for independence from the British were defeated, suffering heavy losses. Many lost their lives on the fields of Culloden. Legend says that birds no longer sing above the boggy land where Jacobites made their final stand. That rhymed, that wasn't intentional. Locals have witnessed a tartan wearing spirit wandering through the moor there. Those who get close enough manage to hear it muttering one single word, defeated. Every single year on April 16th, the anniversary of the battle, they say you can still hear the clashing of swords and the sound of men dying, locked in their bloody battle for eternity. Next up at number 5 now, we have Proven Hall. Many people in Glasgow will know this as one of the oldest buildings in the city. It was built as a hunting lodge for the bishops of Glasgow in 1471. That's more than 20 years before Christopher Columbus set sail. For all you history buffs out there trying to get your head around the dates, it's a pretty old building. It has played host to some distinguished guests as well, including Mary Queen of Scots and her father, King James V. Ghosts have been reported at the hall ever since those days. Locals say they've seen spirits of murderers and also their victims. The master bedroom is said to be haunted by a man with a dagger. They say that in the 19th century, he came home from two years at war to find his wife had had a baby with another man. In a fit of rage, he stabbed her to death and then slit his own throat. Another less violent ghost that's been seen is that of Reston Mathers. He was a previous owner of the hall who is often seen on the staircase. He died there in 1934 after breathing problems and is said to always be dressed in a black bowler hat and sporting a bright white beard. Next up number 4 now, we have the Green Lady of Crathers Castle. Many people know of the Green Lady of Crathers Castle, a forlorn spirit that has been seen by an alarming amount of people over the years. The castle was built in the 16th century and despite its grand size, the Green Green Lady is only ever seen in one room. She paces back and forth in front of the fireplace there, sometimes cradling an infant in her arms. Apparently, even Queen Victoria herself saw the spectre while staying in the castle one night. Some say that in life the apparition was a servant girl who fell pregnant out of wedlock and mysteriously disappeared soon after. For a while, this was just dismissed as nonsense, but in the 1800s, a grisly discovery was made. While renovating a fire place, some workmen uncovered the skeletal remains of a woman and child. Even that story has now been lost in the sands of time. Moving on to number 2 now, we have the Kelpsy. These are perhaps some of the most feared and famous creatures in Scottish folklore. Most accounts describe these creatures as shapeshifters that often take the form of a horse. When they appear in human male form, they are often very hairy. They jump out at lone travellers on deserted roads and crush their victims to death. If they appear in human female form, their behaviour is altogether different. They take the form of a beautiful woman and lure men to their deaths in the water, much like the sirens that we've talked about in other cultures' urban legend videos. In horse form, they're perhaps even more dangerous though. It's said that they entice people to climb on their back for a ride, only to drown them. What's even more twisted is that they apparently target children in particular. Many centuries ago, people in Scotland would be wary of dark or white ponies that appear to be lost. They feared they were kelp that would take them to a watery grave. One way to spot a Kelpie from a normal horse was that Kelpies had dripping manes, a sign that they had recently come from water. When a Kelpie's tail entered water, it made a sound like thunder, a sure sign to stay indoors as a Kelpie was on the prowl. And finally at number 1 now, we have the Flannan Isles Lighthouse Mystery. These isles are a group of uninhabited rocks off the coast of mainland Scotland. One of the islands is called Eileen Moor and features a grass hill at its highest point. On top of that lies Flannan Isles Lighthouse. A year after it was built, on December 7th 1900, the new lighthouse keepers arrived. They were Donald MacArthur, Thomas Marshall and James Ducat. The inspector made sure they were ok and then left. Soon after, the island became enveloped in a thick, rolling fog. The inspectors couldn't see the lighthouse from the mainland because of this fog. A ship that went by a week later reported that the lighthouse was not 
shining its light. After a full three weeks, the lighthouse had still not been seen and the men had not returned from their rotation on the island. A rescue ship found that the island was empty. The lighthouse was locked. The clock on the wall had stopped and there was a cooked meal just sat on the table. The last entry in the log had been made almost two weeks before. Authorities concluded they were swept away by a storm, but locals had maintained something supernatural happened on that island and that the fog had something to do with it. Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have Briavel's Castle in Gloucester. I don't know. If I said that wrong, Remove some letters. I don't know what to tell you. Briavel's castle is a ruined Norman fortress located in the Forest of Dean, and over the years, the castle has been the subject of many haunting tales and ghostly sightings. One of the most famous stories of that is the White Lady who is said to haunt the castle. According to legend, she is the ghost of a woman who was wrongly accused of stealing from the castle and was subsequently executed. Her ghost has been reported to roam the castle's halls and corridors, and she has been seen by many visitors and staff members. Another famous ghostly tale from the castle is that of the phantom coach, who is said to drive up to the castle gates before disappearing without a trace. Legend has it that the coach is driven by the ghost of a former owner of the castle who was killed by his own wife and her lover. In addition to these tales, there have also been reports of unexplained noises and strange apparitions throughout the castle. Despite the many stories of ghosts and hauntings, this castle remains a popular tourist destination and a fast fascinating piece of British history. Why not head over for a visit? I heard you can even stay in the oubliette. In our number 9 spot today we have the Glasgow Necropolis. This place is exactly what it sounds like. It is a necropolis and what place is more haunted than a necropolis? The Glasgow Necropolis is a Victorian cemetery located on a hill overlooking Glasgow, Scotland. Over the years it has become a popular spot for ghost hunters and paranormal enthusiasts due to the many haunting tales that surround the site. One of the most famous ghost stories associated with the necropolis is that of a female ghost. According to legend, she is the ghost of a wealthy woman who was buried in a white dress and veil. Her ghost has been seen by many visitors floating among the tombstones and crypts. Another tale involves the ghost of a man who was buried alive. Legend has it that he woke up in his coffin and tried to escape but died before he could make it out. Visitors have reported hearing knocking sounds coming from the ground and feeling cold spots near his grave. At the end of the day, while there are thousands of people buried here, only a small group have gravestones and even fewer have names. This only adds to the eerie nature of the cemetery. There are even rumors that a vampire just might be wandering the grounds looking for its next prey. All in all, this place is full of haunting tales, urban legends, and a whole bunch of spook. In our number 8 spot today, we have Pluckley in Kent. The village of Pluckley, located in the county of Kent, England, is known for being one of the most haunted villages in the entire country. There are numerous ghost stories associated with the village, many of which have been passed down through generations. One of the most famous tales is that of the Screaming Woods, a dense forest area on the outskirts of the village. According to legend, the woods are haunted by the ghost of a highwayman who was caught and killed by villagers and his screams can still be heard at night. Another famous ghost story involves the Watercress Woman, a ghostly figure who is said to appear near a stream in the village carrying a basket of watercress on her arm. It is believed that she drowned in the stream while picking watercress and her ghost has been seen by many villagers over the years. Other reported sightings include ghosts of a monk, a schoolmaster, and even a haunted pub. Despite the spooky tales, Pluckley remains a charming and picturesque village, attracting visitors from around the world. Visit if you dare. In our number 7 spot today, we have Chillingham Castle in Northumberland. Chillingham Castle, located in Northumberland, England, is considered to be one of the most haunted castles in the country. The castle has a dark and mysterious history, and there have been numerous reports of paranormal activity over the years. One of the most famous ghosts associated with the castle is the Blue Boy. According to legend, the ghost is a spirit of a young man who was imprisoned in a room in the castle and left to die. His ghost has been seen by many visitors, appearing as a blue flash of light or as a boy dressed in blue clothing. Another famous tale is that of a specific room in the castle where prisoners were once harmed and then executed. Visitors have reported feeling cold spots, hearing unexplained noises, and even feeling the presence of the ghosts of the tormented prisoners. Other reported sightings include 
include ghosts of a lady in white, a soldier, and even a ghostly cat. In our number six spot today, we have Corfe Castle. Corfe Castle, located in Dorset, England, is a ruined fortress with a rich history and many ghostly tales. The castle was originally built in the 11th century and was destroyed during the English Civil War in the 17th century. One of the most famous ghosts associated with the castle is that of Lady Banks, the wife of the castle's owner during the Civil War. According to legend, she defended the castle against enemy soldiers and was killed during the siege. Her ghost has been seen wandering the castle ruins dressed in a long white gown. Another famous tale is that of the Drummer Boy, a ghostly figure who is said to haunt the castle gatehouse. According to legend, the boy was caught spying on enemy soldiers and this swiftly led to his demise. His ghost has been seen and heard drumming his sticks on the castle walls. As you walk up the steps to the castle, you might also learn about Edward the Martyr, who was set to be king until he also lost his life here at the hands of his own stepmother who wanted her own birth son to be the heir to the throne. Other reported sightings include ghosts of soldiers, knights, and even a headless woman. Didn't see that one coming. In our number five spot today, we have Whitby Abbey, North Yorkshire. Whitby Abbey is a ruined Gothic abbey located in the seaside town of Whitby, North Yorkshire in England. And upon looking at it, it totally makes sense why people say this was part of the inspiration for Dracula. The abbey has a rich history and has been the subject of many haunting tales over the years. One of the most famous ghost stories associated with the abbey is that of the Whitby Abbey ghost. Of course. According to legend, the ghost is the spirit of a young woman who fell to her death from the abbey's high tower while trying to escape her angry husband. Her ghost has been seen wandering the abbey ruins dressed in a white dress. Ghosts really seem to vibe with white dresses for some reason. Another famous tale is that of the Black Abbot, a ghostly figure who is said to haunt the abbey's grounds. According to legend, the Black Abbot was a former abbot of the monastery who was executed for his crimes. His ghost has been seen wearing a black robe and carrying a book. Other reported sightings include ghosts of monks, nuns, and even a ghostly dog. Despite the many spooky tales, Whitby Abbey remains a popular tourist destination, offering visitors a glimpse into the fascinating history of the Abbey and the paranormal activity associated with it. In our number four spot today, we have Glencoe Argyll. Glencoe is a beautiful and rugged valley located in the Argyll region of Scotland and is pretty famous for being one of the settings in the Bond film Skyfall, but it's also famous for its haunting tales. The area is steeped in history and it all starts back in 1692 with what is known as the Massacre of Glencoe. In that year, soldiers loyal to the English crown killed members of the Macdonald clan who had been hosting them as guests. It is said that the ghosts of the lost McDonald's still haunt the valley, seeking revenge on their killers. Another famous tale is that of the Grey Man. According to legend, the Grey Man is a ghostly figure who is set to haunt the summits of the mountains in Glencoe. His ghostly presence has been reported by many climbers and hikers over the years. In our number three spot today, we have Highgate Cemetery, London. The cemetery is located in London, and for years it has been the central point of many a horrific tale. These stories include those of demons, ghosts, and all things paranormal, and even the famous Highgate Vampire. Legend goes that the cemetery is home to this vampire, as first reported by two girls walking through the area. They claimed to see the dead rise from their graves. Soon after this report came the discovery of animal carcasses, which is never a good sign, but to make matters worse, all of these ones had been drained of their blood. Stories of the vampire spread like wildfire, and people were right pretty creeped out. This all led to the vampire hunt that took place on Friday, April 13th, 1973. Friday the 13th. It's never good. During this hunt, residents of the town began exhuming bodies and then also beheading them. Okay? There are still many rumors and stories that swirl around the area, and I'm just gonna go ahead and say, if the gates to hell weren't located here before the beheadings, they definitely are now. In our number two spot today, we have the Skurid Inn in Wales. I love visiting a place that has lots of history. You know when you enter a building and can learn about its history and the people who used to walk in its halls? It's just so interesting and very cool, except for when you're sipping away on a cold, tasty pint and find out that where you're sitting is a place that used to be used for public hangings. Yeah, things get a bit more grim when you bring that story up, all right? I don't know if I want what's on those taps. That 
that is exactly the history behind the Skurid Inn. The upper area of the pub was once used as a courthouse where people would stand trial. If the person on trial was convicted and sentenced to death, I guess this place was super convenient because they also wouldn't have to waste any time and could just carry out the sentence right then and there. A bit dark I'd say. The bar decided it would keep the creepy little cell that was once used to hold the prisoners, which seems like an odd choice, but I guess it's all in the name of history? It is estimated that around 180 executions took place here and to this day you can still take a peek at the hanging beam that was used way back when. Not exactly sure I'd want to as there is no way that thing isn't cursed. Many people who have been to the bar state that they have felt things like a sudden drop in temperature, the feeling of a rope around their neck, or even seeing some strange, scary, shadowy figures. I got a strange feeling that if you were to head into the cell that's still around, you just might find yourself in a place that you don't want to go to. In our number one spot today, we have Blickling Hall in Norfolk. Blickling Hall, located in Norfolk, England, is a beautiful, stately home that dates back to the 15th century, and it has been the subject of numerous reported ghost sightings and paranormal activity. One of the most famous ghost stories associated with the hall is that of the Anne Boleyn ghost. According to legend, Anne Boleyn, the second wife of Henry VIII, was born at Blickling Hall, and her ghost is said to haunt the property. Her ghost has been seen wearing a white dress and carrying her own severed head. That is really about as haunting as it gets. Apparently on the anniversary of her execution, people have reported seeing Anne ride up to the estate in a ghostly carriage, driven by a man who is also headless. Another famous tale is that of the screaming lady. It is said that a lady who was killed in the hall has been heard screaming in the corridors at night. The estate is now owned by the National Trust because no one else would want to buy that haunted of a house, and it remains a popular spot for those interested in history as well as the paranormal. <laughs>